I'd like you all to take out your cell phones. Everybody, if you have a cell phone here. Now, you might have been like one person in our first service who she didn't have her cell phone. She leaves it in the car so she can bring her Bible, and we certainly honor that. But you're going to see what I'm saying in a minute. Now, hold your cell phone up. And please repeat these words. I don't see all the cell phones. I want to see everybody's cell phone up. I don't see them all. Everybody's cell phone. Get them up. You're going to repeat these words after me. This is my pocket Bible. And it also makes phone calls. I want you to hear those words. This is a pocket Bible. It goes with us everywhere we go. Isn't that good news? That's amazing. So if you're going to use your pocket Bible, you certainly can. You can go to BibleGateway.com or to the U version of the Bible app. And we will be looking out of Acts chapter 4. But I also want you to hear that good news for another reason. So often we see these as a distraction from God's words. Amen? And we think that it keeps us from focusing on what God wants us to focus on. That's not true if we see it as our pocket Bible. You can be sitting in your car and you can have 20 minutes or 5 minutes and you can pull out your pocket Bible and you can type in in Google John 1 and it will come up and you can read the first chapter of John. You can go to Bible Gateway. You can talk to one of the pastors about other ways in which we can help you learn to use the tools that God gives to us. Because I believe that what happens in this world is when things change, God uses the new technologies and the new things that are made available to us so that we can get to know God better and get to know his word better. Now, why did I share that with you today? It's going to be something I'm going to try to remind us as we move forward in weeks, months, and years ahead until everybody gets sick of hearing it. But there's another reason I shared it, because that's good news. And that's what we're talking about, sharing good news. Sharing our faith is also sharing good news. It's telling somebody something that should make them smile and happy. God loves you. God cares about you. Jesus died on the cross for you. But the problem is, the way that we share our faith is so negative and so uncomfortable that we tend to, again, as I said earlier, take a step up above people, talk down to them, make people feel bad about things or, or get defensive, and that's not sharing the good news. And so what we've been talking about is how we learn to share our faith. And it's not only sharing our faith, it's sharing any bit of good news. Something that can be helpful for someone else, having even those difficult conversations in our life. We call this sermon series, Bless, because we begin with prayer. And maybe that's where you still are in sharing your faith with someone. Maybe you have somebody you just are praying for, continue to pray for them. But it also means we learn to listen to people, not talk first, but listen first. We talked last week about eating, the importance of having fellowship with others so that we really get to know people, and today we're talking about serving. Serving is like giving good news to people. It's doing it in a humble fashion in which people see that we care about them. Because here's what I realized as I was getting prepared for this message. People drive by this church all the time. They drive back and forth on Carver Road. They see the church. They go down Samoset Street. They see you and me. They are aware that we're here. They do not care what we believe. There's nobody sitting around in Plymouth thinking, gee, I wonder what those people over at Faith Community Church believe. But you know what they do care? How we treat people. They care how we serve, how we act towards others. That's the same thing that's true in your personal life with everybody in your life. People will judge us and listen to us or not listen to us based on how we treat them. Amen? Amen? And so learning to serve isn't learning to take somebody's trash out, even though if anybody would like to take our trash out, the dumpster's over here, you can stop by any time, and I'll give you a bag and you can take the trash out. That is a form of service, but that's not the kind of service we're talking about today. The kind of service we're talking about is by learning to be God's people in such a way that we honor other people in the way in which we treat them. For that reason, with our cool Bible, pocket Bibles, or if you brought your regular Bible with you, we're going to be looking today out of the book of Acts. 
And we're looking at a character who sometimes we can miss because we have some of these minor characters in the scriptures and they're not Peter and they're not Paul and they're not Moses and they're not Elijah, they're not Mary, the mother of Jesus, they're not Hannah, they're not Ruth, Naomi. They're just sort of these lesser characters. And it's important to realize that they're there to help us understand how to live our Christian lives. One of them is a guy named Joseph who also gets the nickname Barnabas. And he gives us the example of how to serve. And so I'm calling our message today, Serve Like Barnabas. The background to our text is that the church was just a baby church. The number of people we have gathered here today would have made the early Christians happy. In fact, the number we would have had at our Saturday service would have thrilled them because they were just getting started as a congregation and starting to share the gospel. And now there were needs that were happening in the early church, and along comes this one little guy whose name is Joseph, and the Christians renamed him. They gave him the name Barnabas because of the characteristics of how he lived his life. And the question I really am asking as we're talking about learning to serve is this guy got a nickname, which means son of encouragement. If somebody was giving you and me a nickname, what would they call us? You don't get to vote on that today for me. We do have little form boxes, but there aren't any votes on what should Pastor Stan be called. But the question really does come to each one of us personally. Who do other people see us as? How do we treat others? What is the legacy that we're leaving behind? And why are people either open to us sharing our faith with them or not if it really comes down to how we treat people? Because what we learn about Barnabas, this guy Joseph who gets renamed Barnabas, is the first thing he teaches us about serving is if we're going to serve others, it means we need to encourage others. We need to learn to be encouragers. Listen to Acts chapter 4, verses 36 through 37. There was Joseph, the one the apostles named Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came to, from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field that he owned, and he brought it, the money to the apostles and laid it at their feet. There's power in encouragement, and that's how this guy lived his life. He was a person who, when he saw needs, he said, how can I help? When the early church was getting started, he was so helpful that, again, even in our text, he didn't come to church and have somebody say, you know what we need to do is we're taking up a collection today, and he didn't go, oh, I can't believe they're asking for money once again. He realized that God had graced and empowered his life, and he saw it as a privilege to help others a privilege to be generous, a privilege to use what he had been given to encourage the other Christians. So he goes out and he even sells a field and brings the money and gives it to others. When we are able to be an encourager, it transforms people's lives. It makes all the difference in the world. Because people go through life and they're desperate for somebody to just breathe words of encouragement not to tell them what they're doing wrong, not to tell them a problem that we have with them, but to just tell them, hey, you know, here's something I see that's great about you, or here's something that I always appreciate being around you. Because I am convinced that people know all their failures. Do you know that? They don't need us to point them out. If you walked up to somebody and said, what are all the things you do wrong? They can already tell them. It got me thinking about how is it that some people can overcome their failures? It's because other people are able to help them move beyond them. Or they're able to stay encouraged themselves. There was a guy who lost his job. Then he decided to run to be a state legislature, and he got beat. A year later, he had a business, and his business failed. That was quite a bit for him to handle, and three years, years later, he had a nervous breakdown and ended up in the hospital. He did, however, shortly after that, get elected to be a state legislature in his little state out in the Midwest, and he decided he wanted to run to be the speaker of the legislature, and he was defeated. Later, he thought that he should be a congressman, so he tried to get his party's nomination, but once again, he was defeated. 
He didn't know what else to do, so he was trying to do public service because he really cared about making the world a better place, and so he went to become the land officer, and he was rejected for that also. Not knowing what else to do, he decided to run for the U.S. Senate, where you got it, he got beat. However, he did have some connections nationally, and so the way that they used to do it, they actually had at one time in America fair elections between the president and the vice president, and so it wasn't just the president choosing their vice president, so he ran to be the vice president nominee of his party, and again, he got defeated. Following that, he ran for Senate one more time, and you got it, he lost. But somehow, this guy stayed encouraged. Good thing, because we just were talking about President Abraham Lincoln. People know the things that go wrong in their lives. Amen? People understand their failures. They don't need us to point them out. To be a Barnabas, to serve the way that we're invited to serve as Christians, is to learn to encourage others. For how we treat people matters. What would our nickname be? If you had to ask those who are closest to you in your life, what would you nickname me? What would they say? Early when I first gave my life to Jesus, I was a college student at Moorhead State in Minnesota. I gave my life to Christ through an organization called Campus Crusade. Now today it's called Crew. And shortly after I came to faith, I was given a young man who discipled me. I thought that the purpose of him discipling me was I was just going to spend a year going to his Bible study and learning from him. And about the second week, he looked at me and he goes, you can be a leader. What do you mean, I can be a leader? He goes, you can start your own Bible study. I said, I barely know the scriptures. He goes, that's okay. I'll make sure we're a couple weeks ahead in the Bible study that we do and you can start your own Bible study. We talked about that study a few weeks ago. We ended up, out of 30 guys on our floor, 29 of them ended up coming to that Bible study. Good thing somebody encouraged me and spoke some words of possibility. Are you and I able to do that? Because that's what it means to be a servant. That's what it means to learn to serve others, is to be the person who encourages those who get discouraged, because we all know people in our lives who are discouraged. We all know people who are going through tough times and people who are frustrated. Because when we encourage, we're really being generous. We're really taking what God has blessed us and sharing it with someone else. We're taking the abundance of what God pours into us and realizing that it's not that we're better than someone else, but our cup is overflowing. And if our cup is overflowing, we give that to others. That's what I see even happened with Barnabas with this field that he sold. What ended up happening is he was realizing that he'd come to faith in Christ. He was doing pretty well for himself. The early church was getting discouraged. They probably were having a hard time doing anything, keeping together. They were being persecuted as early Christians. And he said, well, God's blessed me. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to encourage you by taking something that I have and selling it and sharing it with others. Years ago, I was in my first church in Lowell. I Love to go back and think of those days. And my mom and dad had recently retired, which meant that they spent half of the year, they came out to Massachusetts and stayed with us in Lowell, and then the other half, they went back to North Dakota. And one Sunday, a young woman came into our church with a little girl, and I noticed my mom befriended her. And so a few weeks went by, and this woman continued to come. And we were sitting at dinner, a Sunday dinner after church one day, and my mom turned to me and said, oh, Tammy's having her little girl baptized in two weeks. I said, what? <laughs> I'm the pastor, remember that? <laughs> like, that's my choice? And I said, oh, she is. She said, oh, yeah, I'm your mother. I just want you to know. I talked to her, and she's having a bat child baptized in a couple weeks. I said, oh, good, thank you for telling me. Oh, and one more thing. Now, you've got to understand, my mom didn't drive. My dad drove. My mom didn't. She said, also, next Tuesday, I want you to pick up Tammy and myself, and we're going to go shopping because I'm going to make Tammy a baptismal gown for her daughter. So I got to spend the day driving my mom and Tammy all over the place, finding all these fabric stores. Then they came back to our house, and my mom made this most gorgeous baptismal gown 
for her little girl. What I started to discover is that my mom had gotten to know Tammy well, and Tammy was a single mom, and the father of her little girl was in prison. And my mom just wanted to help this young woman and get to know her and build a relationship with her. Eventually, the dad got out of prison, and he started getting involved with our church also. One time, I said to my mom, you know, when you got to know this young woman, you bought silk. You bought the, like, you really went out. How did you know that she was going to stay involved with our church? She said, oh, I didn't, but I've learned this in life. When you give, you give your best. When you encourage, you encourage your best. If you're going to breathe love into someone, breathe the best love into them. Encourage them. Help people to understand they know the things they've done wrong, just like we do. They understand the frustrations and the hurts and the pains in their life. It's our privilege that God has done so much for us that we get to be in the place to be the Barnabases of the 21st century. Amen? Amen. That's who you are. That's who God created you to be. And that's why we come to church, so we can learn what God teaches us about ourselves and others so that we don't go through life seeing the problems with everyone else and we don't see the things that we want to criticize people for. In fact, what we start to do if we're really God's servants, as we start seeing potential. What a different way to live our lives. To look at every single person that we know and see the potential of what God can do with them. You see, people know what happens if they fail. We know what happens if we fail. People know the hurts and the fears and the things that they're concerned about. What they need us as Christians to do is to breathe to them and speak to them the potential of who God is making them to be. Wow, look at what an amazing thing is happening in your life. Oh, you're starting a new business? Wow, that business would probably, that's going to do great. That's going to do awesome. Wow, you're having a new relationship? Yeah, your last 75 of them didn't work out, but this one is going to work out. You see, we know our problems. As Christians, if we're going to be servants, we need to help people see the potential of what God's doing in their life. Which brings us back to Barnabas. In the early church, as those few people gathered together, the Roman officials and the religious leaders within the Jewish community weren't very happy. They didn't like us. In fact, they wanted to get rid of us. In any way they could stop the movement of the early church they wanted to. And so the Bible teaches us that one of the things that they did is they started persecution and literally early Christians were martyred for their faith. And there's this one story where there's this guy named Stephen and he's a Christian and people stand around and they pick up literal rocks and they throw them at him and they hit him and he dies. And as he's being stoned to death, there's a guy named Saul of Tarsus who's standing there egging him on. Now what's amazing is shortly after that, this guy Saul is walking to the road of Damascus, and he sees a light, he hears a voice, and he gives his life to Jesus. So let's set the stage. There is a guy in Plymouth who's going around trying to kill people in Faith Community Church, and now he's come to faith and decides he wants to be part of our congregation. You can imagine what the early Christians thought. He is a Trojan horse. He's going to come here to get to know us for one purpose and only one purpose. He wants to know who we are so we can be persecuted also. And then in Acts chapter 9, we get that one word. You know what the word is? But. You're going to say that with me. But. Everybody knew everything that was wrong with Saul. Everybody knew the way that Saul had treated others. Saul had a negative reputation among the Christians. None of the Christians wanted to talk to him, but, Acts chapter 9, verse 27, but Barnabas took hold of Saul and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken boldly the name of Jesus. Other people pointed out the problems with Saul, but Barnabas saw the potential. 
Are you able to do that in your life? Are you able to see the potential of the people that you love and you care about? Are you able to see the potential in the people you don't like and you don't care about? Because that's what we're asked to be as Christians. If we're being transformed by the Holy Spirit, we start serving people by seeing what God wants for their life. Everybody else had a problem. But not Barnabas. He said, let's give the guy a chance. What's the worst that can happen? We all die and we'll all have a feast in heaven. Hey, it's not going to be that bad anyhow. With our staff this last year, we read a book called Hero Maker. It comes out of a basic theory that everybody wants to be a hero. We all want to tell great things about ourselves and think great things about ourselves. I want to preach a good sermon so people say, that was a good sermon, pastor, stand there, or I become a hero. Somebody else wants to do volunteer work in the church and have somebody say, wow, you did a really great job, wow, that was beautiful, they become a hero. At work, the same thing. People want to take on a project so that people recognize them and they work hard and they spend extra hours and everybody goes, wow, you did a good job. Get patted on the back and they become a hero. The point of this author was, as Christians, we aren't called to be heroes, we're called to be hero makers. We're not called to elevate ourselves and say, how can we do something great and how can we do more? But we are asked, how can we live in such a way that we can see the potential in other people and help them see what God wants to do in their lives? We learn to be hero makers. Then we were invited to take a napkin, because again, you eat with people and you're going to be at a meal with someone. And write on the napkin, whenever you're with anybody, they won't know what you're doing, take a pen and write the letters I, C, and you. I see in you. And instead of pointing out in our conversations with people the things that are wrong in their lives, start to talk to the potential in people's lives so that we can truly start being hero makers and help people see the potential of what God wants to do in their lives. Because you see, what it means to serve is not just helping people do things. It's learning to be the person that God wants us to be so we can help people get over the humps of their life for all the things that discourage them and frustrate them. And when we start seeing in others what God sees in them, the potential that God has for other people, we start becoming like Barnabas. And we get guys like Saul who become the Apostle Paul who writes half the New Testament and starts more churches than anyone else. Because that's what it means to be a servant. If we're going to share the good news with someone, if we're going to share the fact that God loves them, don't you think it would be helpful to start with letting people know how much we care about them and how much we see in them and what a great person they are and what incredible potential they have in their lives? To be a servant means to encourage. It means to see potential but it also means something that we all have a hard time with. It also means we need to learn to give one more chance. Because I got a secret for you. This is where I wish I had the big screens that would say newsflash. Ready? Newsflash, we're all flawed people. Hear me? Newsflash, we make mistakes. Newsflash, your family makes mistakes. Newsflash, People will disappoint you and me and everyone. It's part of the human experience. Because even as we give our lives to Christ, we still have this sin problem in our lives that the Holy Spirit's working out in our lives. And the Holy Spirit is working so that we become transformed and changed. But even with the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we mess up. You can imagine the people in our lives that aren't really trusting in God and aren't being led by the Holy Spirit and aren't reading Scripture. Guess what? They're messing up time and time again. But if we're going to live out the gospel, if we're going to serve the way Jesus invites us to serve, if we're going to serve learning to be a Barnabas, we need to start serving by giving people one more chance. Acts chapter 15, verse 36, where we introduced to Barnabas and Saul. Only now Saul has become Paul. Remember him? Last time we saw him, he was this guy who had been persecuting the church. 
and he came to faith, and nobody trusted him. But now Barnabas had brought him in, and he started to do his work, and now the Christians thought he was a pretty good guy. And so this guy Saul got a new name. He becomes Paul, Paul the great apostle. And he went out on a missionary journey, and we're told about that all the way up into Acts chapter 13, that he and Barnabas, his friend who had encouraged him, the two of them went out throughout the whole Roman Empire, and they started to start churches. And as they started churches, people started to come to faith. And as people started to come to faith, new churches were being built. And then he starts writing letters to them, and he writes half the New Testament. And now people are feeling really good. Wow, this guy Paul, he's awesome. But then when we get to Acts chapter 13, we read verse 13 about something that's unfortunate that happened. Paul and Barnabas had taken along with them a young guy, and his name was John Mark. And probably, if you think about it, they were probably thinking, well, this will be a great opportunity. If we're going to help a young man become an apostle and, and learn to start churches on his own, he needs to learn from the best, so let's take him with us. But then in verse 13, we're told that this young guy, John Mark, the going got too tough for him, and he went home. The passage actually says that he returned back to Jerusalem. We don't really know why. Maybe he got homesick. Maybe he got fearful. Maybe the work was too much for him. Maybe it was too intense. Whatever the reason. Maybe he had a crisis of his faith and he wasn't really sure of what he believed at that moment. But for some reason, this young guy that they're working with just skedaddles it out of there and Paul and Barnabas continue their work. And now we come to chapter 15. And listen to what happens. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return to the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord, and let's see how they're doing. So in other words, Paul says, hey, Barnabas, let's go back and check on those churches we planted. Barnabas wanted to take John with him. Remember, he's the guy who deserted? Of course he did. He's Barnabas. He sees the best in people. John, who was also called Mark. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him who deserted in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them in the work. There occurred such a sharp disagreement. That means the two men started to fight with each other and got upset with them. And you can see the stage. Barnabas standing there saying, Paul, we give people another chance. Paul saying, no, the work's too important. We don't need some young kid who's going to desert us again. Barnabas saying, Paul... We're Christians. This is what we do. We give another opportunity. The two of them separated. Barnabas goes off with John Mark, and Paul takes somebody else along with him. Barnabas always gave another chance. Barnabas, even when people failed, understood, yeah, people fail. The gospel message says people fail, and they get another opportunity. Can we do that in our lives? Can we do that with our loved ones? Can we do that with the people we're closest to? Can we do that with the people who mess up? If we're going to have conversations about what it means to be a Christian and how God forgives us, do you think maybe we can learn to be forgiving? Do you think we can exude and live out the very gospel message that gets breathed into our lives so that we can share it with others, so that when we're telling somebody something, we're not just speaking words, but we're speaking a truth that transforms our lives. It's interesting that later, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4.11, he writes to young Timothy and he says, I'd like you to bring John named Mark with you because he's learned to be an encouragement to me. So somehow even the Apostle Paul later was able to recognize that maybe I was wrong. Maybe God hadn't given up on this young person. You see, service isn't just doing things for people. Because far too often when we do things for people, we're actually standing up here and looking down on someone and saying, well, I'm really glad you need me. Let me see what I can help you with. Wow, I really feel good about the fact that you can't fix that. It's great. Fix it for somebody. It's a good thing to do. That's awesome. But why are we doing it? Genuine biblical learning to be a servant is to learn to take a step down and to humble ourselves and to say, this is what I see in you. This is the potential. Let me encourage you. Wow, you're great. It's awesome to be around you. I appreciate you taking time being from, with me 
rather than me taking my busy schedule to be with you. Because when we learn to encourage and serve the way that the Scripture teaches to serve, we start living out the gospel. And we start embodying the very message that Jesus uses to transform our lives. But I don't want us to miss the point. Giving people one more chance is difficult work. It's hard. Do I get an amen? Giving people one more chance is hard. Amen? It's some of the hardest stuff that we're asked to do. And yet we get examples and we see them all over the place, but sometimes we miss them. Coming to New England, the history of Massachusetts and New England has always fascinated me. And I think like probably a lot of kids, when I was probably in middle school, I first got interested in the Salem witch trials. And then a few years ago, I had an opportunity to do some work up at Gordon-Conwell Seminary in which I got to delve a little bit more into the whole history of what took place in Salem and Salem Village and what is now modern-day Salem and Danvers. And I was new, and I think we all know some of the stories. We know about these young girls who started having these fits and started to accuse people of, of being witches. And we know that there were very innocent people whose lives were taken in some just horrible, tragic part of New England history. We probably also know names like Giles Corey and Rebecca Nurse. Rebecca Nurse was a 71-year-old woman, just faithfully attended church. She was a woman who was a saint in her congregation, and people cared about her. And now these young women started accusing her of being a witch, and she was put to death. That got me thinking of something else that I wanted to look into. What happened to those girls? Think of carrying that with you the rest of your life. You're a 14-year-old girl, and you accused a 71-year-old woman who was just a nice grandmother in your congregation of being a witch, and she was put to death because of your false testimony. What I discovered is I did some more reading and tried to find out what, what do we know about it, and I discovered that there's only one of the young girls who ever came to terms with what she had done. Her name was Ann Putnam. Fourteen years later, she's now a young woman in her late 20s, she realized that she wanted to be forgiven. She wanted to be able to admit what she had done repent of what she had done. She knew that God had forgiven her, but she wanted to be able to go through the streets of Salem and go to church on Sunday morning and know that she was given a clean slate because she was genuinely sorry and had done something awful and wrong. So she contacted the pastor. His name was Joseph Green. And she and Joseph Green met together and she worked through all of the stuff that had happened and she ended up under the advice of the pastor, writing a testimony and saying, this is what happened, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I seek forgiveness, I seek restitution. But the story didn't end there. Joseph Green said, in order for this to take place, I need you to meet together with Rebecca Nurse's son, Samuel. And Samuel met with Ann Putnam and forgave her read her testimony, met with her, and said, I forgive you for the death of my mom. That then allowed Anne to stand before the congregation, acknowledge what she had done, and be received back into the fellowship of that church. You see, folks, forgiveness and giving people a chance isn't easy work to do, amen? It's not just a, oh, that's okay, it doesn't matter what happened. It's literally working through the depths of the problems and the things that have taken place, but allowing our hearts to be transformed the way the son of a woman who was put to death in Salem, Massachusetts, was able to extend forgiveness, and a congregation was able to acknowledge and receive somebody back into real fellowship in the church. You see, sometimes people do things wrong and we kind of whisper and sneak behind their back. And we like to act like Christians that we're forgiving, but we really aren't. Because what we really are is we're really kind of holding on to it as gossip and we keep it going. If we're going to be servants, we need to learn to forgive. 
We need to learn to give people another opportunity. When we think of sharing our faith, sharing our faith is a deep and a personal thing. It doesn't mean that we walk up to somebody and tell them things that they're doing wrong and tell them how what we believe is going to change their lives. It's a process of us building a genuine Christian relationship with other people. And I hope that's what we're hearing in this sermon series. The Bible teaches us what it means to build friendships that are deep, caring, genuine friendships with other people where we pray for them and learn to pray with them. We listen to them and understand who they are and get to know other people in our lives. We eat with them. We invite them into our homes. We have them over for a cookout. We take them out for a cup of coffee. If they like Dunkin' Donuts, we even go to Dunkin' Donuts with them. We just ask them not to post it on social media. (laughs) And we genuinely serve. There may be people in your lives that you need to share the gospel with. There may be people that it really troubles you because you care about this person and you just don't know how to have the conversation with them. As we end our service, if there's anybody that you'd like to come forward and have me pray with you so that you could learn to be Christian with them, to be Christ-like, to be a Barnabas, let's have that conversation and let's have a prayer. Let's pray together. We're going to invite you, as everybody else is singing, if there's anyone that you say, you know, this is somebody who's really struggling, or this is somebody who doesn't get it, or this is someone who's just, every time I try to talk to them, they argue with me, and I don't know what to do. Well, maybe stop arguing and just pray for them. If you'd like to have that conversation, you'd like to have that prayer, I invite you as we close our service. Gracious God, help us to accept the power of the gospel, the power to have our lives truly changed by your Holy Spirit to become the new people you want us to be. Help us to live different, to not just live like everyone else, but to live under the guise of the Holy Spirit changing and transforming our lives. And in that, help us to then learn to serve. We know that we'll never be judged by the things we think. We'll never be judged by the thoughts or the words we tell other people that are our beliefs. But others judge us every day according to how we treat them. We carry a Bible with us. It's our phones every day. But everybody we come in contact with reads the Bible also. And we are that word. We are how others understand what it means to be a Christian. Help us approach those we love with love. Help us to approach those we don't like with love. And help us know that you have a plan and a purpose for people's lives that exceeds anything that we can imagine. We're talking about people that you created, that your son died for personally. Help us have a heart for those who don't know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.